the Prime Minister, Toby Perkin. No more, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm sure that members from all sides of the House will want to join me in sending our thoughts and prayers to all those affected by the collapse of the Brumadinho Dam in Brazil. We are in touch with the local authorities and we stand ready to provide whatever support we can. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Toby Perkin. Firstly, associate myself with the comments of the Prime Minister about the tragic situation in Brazil. Uh, my son is one of thousands of young people to have their life chances transformed by their studies at Chesterville College. The college's funding, like FE colleges across the country, is 30 per cent down in real terms since this government came to power. Yeah. Uh, f- further education funding is in crisis. Why is the education of young people who go to further education colleges worth so little to this government? Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, he could not be more wrong. It is this government. Yes. It is, it is this government that is ensuring that by 2020 the funding available to support, support the funding we're putting into further education is ensuring that we are providing the best life chances for young people who are going into further education. It is this government, it is this, it is this government that is taking steps to ensure that young people are able to take up the opportunities that are right for them. For too long in this country, the assumption has been that the only way to get on in life is to go to university, and other ways, like apprenticeships and further education colleges, have been not been respected in the same way. It is this government that is ensuring we have that respect for further education. It's this government that is ensuring we have the respect for technical education as well. John Winningdale. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Is my right hon. Friend aware that last year was the worst on record for the deaths, imprisonment or hostage-taking of journalists, with 80 across the world killed in the course of their work? Does my right friend agree that journalists fulfil a vital role in a free society, and will she ensure that every opportunity is taken to put pressure on the governments with the worst records to respect media freedom and to take action to protect international journalism? My my right hon. Friend has raised a very important issue, and I certainly agree with him about the important role that a free press and journalists play in our democracies. And I would like to thank him for raising this issue, because I know it is important to him, but many members across the House. And as he says, sadly, in 2018, we saw 80 journalists being killed, 348 are currently in prison, and 60 are being held hostage around the world. And we are deeply concerned, because these numbers, as my right hon. Friend says, have risen on the previous year. That is why, in 2019, we are placing our resources behind the cause of media freedom. We are helping to train journalists around the world, such as in Venezuela, where we have seen an authoritarian government suppress its critics. And this year, and this year we plan to host an international conference in London on media freedom, bringing together countries who believe in this cause to, mutu- to mobilise an international consensus behind the protection of journalists. This is an important issue. This government is putting its weight behind it. Yeah. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, I join the Prime Minister in sending support to the victims of the Brumahindo Dam collapse in Brazil, and I am very pleased that all support is being offered to the authorities there to try and deal with that crisis. Mr Speaker, following the vote in the House last night against no deal, the Prime Minister is again going to attempt to renegotiate the backstop on the basis of finding alternative arrangements. Could she set out today what these alternative arrangements might be? Mr Well, absolutely. Last night, the House uh, voted, set a clear direction on the way that the House could agree a deal, and that's why, and that is about dealing, as the right honourable gentleman says, with the issue of the backstop. As I said yesterday, there are a number of proposals for how that could be done. My right, uh, we're engaging positively with proposals that have been put forward by my right honourable friend, the member for Loughborough, and my honourable friends, the members for North West Hampshire, Wickham, and North East Somerset. Others, including my honourable friend, the member for Altrincham and Sale West, have put forward other proposals, such as a unilateral exit mechanism. And, uh, I'm just telling the Shadow Foreign Secretary. She listens. If, 
a, a, a point of advice. If she wants to shout things, it might be to in re- shout them in response to what I'm saying, rather than just uh, saying... Uh, uh, they put forward proposals such as unilateral exit mechanism or a time limit to the backstop, and the political declaration already references alternative arrangements and raises a number of issues that can be uh, proposals that can be addressed, such as mutual recognition of trusted trader schemes. Jeremy Corbyn! None of that was very clear to me. I don't know about anybody else. <laughs> But it would be it would have been nice, Mr. Speaker. It would have been really nice if the Prime Minister had acknowledged that she did whip her MPs to try and support no deal and was defeated on that. Yeah. And uh, Mr. Speaker The EU said at the weekend they're willing to renegotiate if the government's red lines could change. Could the Prime Minister today set out which of her red lines are going to change. Prime Minister! What has been absolutely clear with my contacts with European Union leaders is that they want a deal. What this House voted for last night is to leave the European Union with a deal, but it also crucially showed what it will take to uh, see a support in this House for uh, for a deal in the future. I think the plan that was set out last night uh, shows that we can obtain a substantial and uh, a sustainable majority in this House. But the Right Honourable Gentleman talks about not being clear about positions on various things. I'm very pleased that he is now going to... I'm very pleased that he is now going to... uh, I'm very pleased he's now going to meet with uh, me, and there are a number of issues that I want to discuss with him. For example, he talks about a strong single market relationship with the European Union in the future. Uh, But he was also... I want to know whether that means he wants to accept all EU state aid rules, for example, because in the past he's objected to state aid rules, and he can't have it both ways. So we need to know with greater clarity what it is the Right Honourable Gentleman believes in, and perhaps, perhaps next time... Perhaps next time one of his own backbenchers wants to ask him about his position on a second referendum, he'll actually take a question and an intervention from him. Mr Speaker, last time I looked at the order paper, it said Prime Minister's question time. And the Prime Minister has herself, has herself, and I quote, the only possible deal was within her red line. So it's perfectly reasonable to ask which of her red lines has changed. This morning, the Brexit Secretary was asked, and I quote, what is the alternative to the backstop? He replied, well, that's what we're exploring. (laughs) Can the Prime Minister tell us which options are being explored? I I listed them in answer to one of the earlier questions the Right Honourable Gentleman gave me. Perhaps also if he listens to the answers to the questions, he he wouldn't have to repeat the question. Jeremy Corbyn! Looking forward to meeting the Prime Minister later on today. Because I want to put forward Labour's alternatives, which could command a majority in this House, and are about protecting jobs and the people's living standards across this country. Mr Speaker, this morning the Brexit Brexit Secretary, Brexit Minister rather, said that alternative arrangements means looking at technology. Very interesting question. So can the Prime Minister be very clear what technological advances is she expecting to be made in the next 58 days? Prime Minister! Can I say to the right honourable gentleman, it would be helpful... It would be helpful... I want to hear about these matters. The Prime Minister. The right honourable gentleman, I have pointed out that there are a number of options that people are putting forward that we are working with them on and working positively with them on. I have already referenced a number of things that are in the political declaration on alternative arrangements that do set out various aspects that could be looked at. I referenced one of them in my answer to his, in my answer to his question earlier. But what I would also say to the right honourable gentleman is that he, you know, last night the House did vote to reject no deal but it also voted to do what the European Union has consistently asked this House to do since it rejected the withdrawal agreement, which was to say what it was that the UK wanted to see change. Last night, a majority in this House voted to maintain the commitment to no hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland, 
to leave the European Union with a deal and to set out to the European Union what it will take to ensure that this House can support a deal. That is a change to the backstop. That is what I will be taking back to the European Union. That is what we will be doing to ensure that we can avoid no deal. He stands up regularly and says he does not want no deal. I am working to ensure we get a deal. He has opposed every move by this government to get a deal. He is the one who is risking no deal. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, I would be grateful if the Prime Minister would actually acknowledge that the House has voted to take no deal off the table. And can she assure the House that if she is unable to secure any legal changes to the backstop, that she would work to find a solution based on a comprehensive customs union, a strong single market deal and the guaranteeing of rights and protections, rather than go back to the alternative that she's been threatening everybody with for months and months, which was to crash out without any deal whatsoever. Prime Minister. Last night, the House did vote to reject no deal. But that cannot be the end of the story. The only way... The right honourable gentleman says, of course not. I think, that's the, I think that's the first time he's actually accepted that you can't just vote to reject no deal. You have to vote for a deal. Otherwise, you leave with no deal. So far, so far, he has opposed everything this government has put forward in relation to a deal. And he said, he said previously he will reject any deal that the government uh, puts on the table. Will he, will he now? He says it's Prime Minister's questions, but people want to know his position as well. Will he ensure that if this government comes back with a revised deal that ensures we don't leave with no deal, he will actually support it? It really is time, Mr Speaker, that the Prime Minister acknowledge she's got to move on from the red lines she's put down in the first place. And she doesn't acknowledge that in answer to my questions or indeed anybody else's. Mr Speaker, our responsibility is to bring people together. Whether they vote... (laughs) Mr Speaker, we are... The Houses of Parliament, we are the House of Commons, we do represent the entire country, and the point I'm making is we should bring people together whether they voted leave or remain. And indeed, I look forward to meeting the Prime Minister to discuss a solution that could, in my view, unite the country. Changes to the backstop alone will not be sufficient. Businesses and trade unions are very clear that any solution, any solution, must involve a customs union and the strongest possible deal with a single market to avoid the damage of no deal. The Prime Minister may have possibly temporarily united her party, but is she willing? Mr Speaker, is... Order! Order! Mr Ellis... You were at one time a barrister of one rank or another in the courts. There is no way that you would have been allowed to shout from a sedentary position in that way, and the judge would have ruled you out of order. I don't know whether that's why you stopped practising law and came into Parliament. <laughs> Behave yourself, young man. You can do so much better when you try. Jeremy Corbyn. Speaker, as I was saying before, I was so rudely interrupted. <laughs> The Prime Minister may have succeeded, may have succeeded in temporarily uniting her very divided party. But, Mr Speaker, is she willing, is she willing to make compromises necessary that are more important, and that is to unite the country on a, a going forward to secure jobs and living standards right across the UK? Prime Minister... Can I, can I say to the right honourable gentleman, he's a fine one to talk about coming together when it was only last night that he agreed to actually meet me to talk about these issues. And he said, he, he's, he's uh, time and time.
and time again he's told me to listen to the views of the House. He's just stood up and said the backstop is not the only issue in the withdrawal agreement. Uh, last night the House voted by a majority to say that the issue that needed to be addressed was the backstop. So he, he needs to listen to the House and to recognise that. And his proposal last night, he put forward a proposal last night which referenced the customs union and the single market, and his proposal was rejected by this House. But I'll tell him what this government has been doing. Over the last week, we've been getting more teachers into schools. We've been ensuring we're giving more money to councils. We won a majority on Brexit. What did he manage? His Brexit plan was voted down. He opposed ending free movement, and he won't rule out a second referendum. He's no plan for Brexit, no good plan for our economy, and no plan for our country. Thank you, Mr Speaker. First-time buyer numbers, which collapsed under the last Labour government, are now at a 10-year high thanks to initiatives like Help to Buy and the first-time buyer stamp duty cut. But there are still many people in their 20s and 30s who want to buy their own home. Will the Prime Minister join me in asking local authorities to use their existing powers when they grant planning consents to make sure that as many properties as possible are designated as starter homes or discount market sales homes to help those people in their 20s and 30s realise the dream of home ownership. My honourable friend raises an important issue, not only in in pointing out the very good news that we see uh, at that 10-year high in the number of uh, first-time buyers, but also the opportunities that are available for local authorities to uh, provide for this. And we obviously are clear that the planning system has a key role in delivering more affordable homes, and the National Planning Policy Framework revised last year uh, was central to this. It includes a wider definition of affordable housing and local authorities are expected to consider the new definition, which includes what my uh, honourable friend has referenced, starter homes and discounted market sales homes, to identify the types of affordable housing their communities need. And there's an expectation that major developments will make a minimum of 10% of homes available for affordable ownership, including starter homes and discounted uh, market sales homes. So we've made good progress on first time buyers, there's more for us to do, and this government is doing it. Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Two weeks ago, the Prime Minister told this House to vote down this deal in the hope of going back to Brussels and negotiating an alternative deal. No such alternative deal exists. Yet last night, she told the House she will go back to Brussels and seek an alternative arrangement. So what is it? Has the Prime Minister inadvertently misled the House, or has this government's incompetence reached a whole new level? Minister. A very, a very simple fact that the right honourable gentleman appears to have, uh, appears to have omitted in, in what he's saying is that the deal was brought to the House, and the House of Commons re- uh, rejected that deal. Therefore, we look to say what can be changed, what can we take back to Brussels, what can we fight for to ensure that the deal can get the support of this, uh, of this House. But I, I'd also like to take the opportunity. I was going to respond to the right honourable gentleman's point of order last night, but unfortunately, when I looked, he'd left, I think, to go and do a Sky News interview. Because I have to say to him, I, I, want, I, want, I want to just confirm absolutely confirm absolutely the commitment of this government to the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. And the remarks the Right Honourable Gentleman made last night in in relation to that were frankly irresponsible. Order, order. The Right Honourable Gentleman has a right to be heard the public would expect him to be heard, and he will be heard. And attempts to shout him down are not just rude, they are irresponsible, they are undemocratic, and they should certainly not have the sanction of anyone who sits on the Treasury bench. Stop it. It's low-grade, it's useless, and it won't work. Ian Blackford. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. That was a graceless response from the Prime Minister, who is acting with sheer irresponsibility. And I have to say in her answer, what she demonstrated is, here are my principles. If you don't like them, you can have some more. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, yeah. last night a majority of Scottish MPs rejected Brexit. The Scottish Parliament, the Welsh yeah, Assembly, yourself. and this House. Order. Order. Stop it. It's utterly irresponsible. Chanting in the background. Let the right honourable gentleman ask his question and the Prime Minister answer it. That is what the public would expect. Ian Blackford. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. The Scottish Parliament, the Welsh Assembly and this House of Commons has rejected the Prime Minister's deal. The UK Government told Scotland in 2014 being part of the UK meant continued EU membership. The UK Government told us we would be part of a family of equal nations. Prime Minister, Scotland wants to stay in the EU. We are scunnered by this Government ignoring Scotland. Prime Minister, do you accept that you have promised Scotland everything, you have delivered nothing? Prime Minister. Can I say to the right honourable gentleman, Scotland is part of the United Kingdom. It voted in 2014 to stay part of the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom will be leaving the European Union. But if the, if the right honourable gentleman wants to talk about the impact of Scotland in the future, perhaps he should look at the latest figures that came out just this morning on exports. Uh, over 60% of Scotland's exports go to the rest of the UK. That's more than Scotland's trade with the rest of the world and over three times more than with the rest of the European Union. And yet he represents a party that wants to erect a border between Scotland and England. The biggest threat, the biggest threat to the future of Scotland is sitting on those benches. Mr Speaker, there is a clear choice between remaining in the customs union or a fully functioning UK independent trade policy. Does my right honourable friend think it is time that the leader of the opposition alters his red lines, repeated twice in its question time, accept the will of the British people and allow businesses to thrive in a post-Brexit world by having a free trade policy? Prime Minister. My honourable friend is absolutely right about what we are uh, aiming to ensure that we get from the, uh, leaving the European Union, which is that ability to have that independent uh, trade policy. That is so important for us as we leave the European Union. Yes, I want to have a good trade relationship with the EU, but I also want to ensure that we are able to have an independent trade policy with those trade deals around the world, and that this country should be a champion for free trade around the world. That is the way not only to enhance our economy and to bring jobs to this country and enhance our prosperity, but actually that will be of benefit for countries around the world, including some of the uh, uh, countries whose economies do need to be helped and improved. Some of the people who are some of the poorest in the world will be helped by those trade arrangements. That's what we are, are going to deliver. That's our commitment to the British people. And as my honourable friend says, it delivers on the result of the referendum. Andy Martin. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My constituent, Lynn Sherman, who has two terminal illnesses, reapplied for her PIP on the 19th of September, but did not receive a home visit assessment until the 6th of January. Shame. She has still not received a decision on her claim. Does the Prime Minister consider it fair or sensible that, in addition to losing her benefit, Ms Sherman has also lost her blue badge? Her bus pass and her carers. Prime Minister. The Honourable Gentleman has raised a specific constituency case, and he, he, the Honourable Gentleman has raised a specific constituency case, and I will ask the relevant department to look into the details of that case. Andrew Percy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On the 12th of July last year, my constituents took their son Jack to Leeds Children's Hospital for a surgery for craniosynostosis. Um, the surgery went well, but after that care he uh, declined post-surgery. Uh, his parents raised concerns. Uh, he declined so much by the 16th of July. Uh, a nurse raised concerns regarding sepsis. Uh, Jack continued to be treated for gastroenteritis. On the next day, Jack died of overwhelming uh, sepsis. 
This is now the subject, sadly, of a, of a coroner's inquest. But what my constituents uh, want is to ensure that this never happens again to another set of parents. Jack was just three days short of his second birthday. The hospital has since then uh, introduced an early warning system for paediatric sepsis, but that's come, that came too late for Jack. Can my, Prime, uh, can, uh, my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, assure me that she will do everything in her powers to ensure that no other parent has to go through what my constituents have been through? Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. First of all, can I say to my honourable friend that I'm sure the whole House will join me in sending our deepest condolences to the family and friends of Jack. A terrible tragedy that has occurred and the loss of such a young life. Can I also say that we recognise, as indeed I'm sure our honourable friend, the member for Dudley South, will confirm that sepsis is a devastating condition. And it is important that the NHS carries on developing its programme of work on recognising sepsis and improving outcomes. I know NHS England and NHS Improvement are working urgently with the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health to establish a single England-wide paediatrics early warning system uh, to improve the recognition of sepsis and response of healthcare services to children and young people. Nothing that we can do obviously can bring Jack back or compensate for the devastating impact on his family. But I can reassure my honourable friend, and I hope he will be able to reassure his constituents, that we're going to continue to do all we can to improve the care for those with this devastating condition. Owen Smith. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister will know that there is a rising tide of racism in our country. Since she came to office, race hate crime has increased by 100 per cent to 72,000 separate attacks last year. What is happening to our country on her watch? Yeah. Prime Minister. Can I say to the Can I say to the honourable gentleman that when I was Home Secretary, I took measures to ensure that we improved the recording of hate crime uh, because actually no, we didn't. We didn't have a full picture of what was uh, of what was happening. My right honourable friend, the Home Secretary, has recently reviewed and revised our hate crime strategy. But the point underlying what the honourable gentleman has said, which is that we none of us should accept hate crime. We should all be very clear from this House that there is no place for hate crime in our society. And wherever we see racism, in whatever form, we should all take action to eradicate it. Vicky Ford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In her discussions with EU leaders, will the Prime Minister be making it crystal clear that this government stands firmly behind all of its commitments under the Belfast Good Friday Agreement? Minister. Very happy to give my honourable friend that absolute assurance and commitment. We stand fully behind our commitments under the Belfast and Good Friday Agreement, and that everything we do will be in the light of those commitments. Tracy Brabin. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Batley and Spen is a community made up of small towns and villages, and buses are a valued and essential service. So I'm sure the Prime Minister will sympathise with my constituents' anger at the recent cuts to services by Arriva announced this week. So much so that commutes are thrown into chaos, people can't get to the shops, and one head teacher told me that they were concerned how their pupils would actually get to school. Doesn't the Prime Minister agree with me that people are more important than profit? And isn't it time to invest in bus services after years of cuts and bring them under public control? Minister. I say to the Honourable Lady, we recognise the importance that buses play in local communities, and that's why we spend £250 million every year to keep fares down and maintain an extensive network, and that benefits people up and down the country. And we particularly put money into uh, supporting free bus travel for older and disabled people because we recognise how particularly important buses are to vulnerable people. Now, we're looking at what we can do further to improve access for people with disabilities, but we have been putting money in to ensure that there remains an extensive bus network which is a benefit to local communities. David Dukit. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Last night, last night this House voted, a majority of this House voted in favour of a deal, a deal to deliver on the democratic will of the people of the United Kingdom and to leave the EU. Will my right honourable friend continue to stand 
stand firm in, in the next phase of negotiations against the fishing nations of the EU and their vain attempts to maintain guaranteed common access to our waters. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can I say to my honourable friend, I can give him absolute commitment yeah. that I will do that. Leaving the common fisheries policy, becoming an independent coastal state is so important to this country to enable us to um, enhance and give opportunities to fishing communities around the United Kingdom. I recognise it is particularly important in Scotland, but uh, there are fishing communities around the whole of the UK who will benefit from us becoming an independent coastal state. And I am very clear, uh, our position is there, we have that agreement, and it is not up for renegotiation. Ian Paisley. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. The, Secret- the Prime Minister will be aware of the report by Sir John Gillan into the laws and procedures around serious sexual offences in Northern Ireland, a very serious preliminary report which already reveals that there is a declining conviction rate in Northern Ireland, that we have the longest delays for getting cases to trial, and those that want to go to trial, there is a 40 per cent dropout. These are serious issues, and I am wondering what the Prime Minister is going to be able to do to ensure that any law changes that Sir John Gillan recommends will be able to be implemented in Northern Ireland. Can I say to the honourable gentleman, Obviously, this is a very clearly it is a very serious issue, and it's something I, I understand the judiciary in Northern Ireland and the devolved uh, justice authorities are keeping under close and active consideration. Of course, as the honourable gentleman knows, policing and justice is a devolved matter in Northern Ireland, as is the length of custodial sentences. Now, the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, in recently passing the Executive Formation and Exercise of Functions Bill enables departments to continue to take decisions in the public interest to ensure the continued operation of public services, but that is not and cannot be a replacement for a devolved government. And I think the example the Honourable Gentleman has given is yet another reason why it's important for us all to work to get the devolved administration back up and running. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister will appreciate that the government is spending over 50% more per head in real terms in education than in the year 2000, achieving much better results, might I add, Mr Speaker. However, there are still some challenges with resources and funding in many areas across Hitchin and Harpenden, especially in small rural schools. Would the Prime Minister commit to special consideration for education in the upcoming spending review, because I believe that this would command widespread support across the House. Prime Minister. Thank you, my honourable friend. I think the uh, the Chancellor was listening to the remarks and the comments that my uh, honourable friend made in his question in relation to funding. It is absolutely right, as my honourable friend says, that we have been putting more money into schools, and it's also right that we see we see more children, 1.9 million more children now, in good or outstanding schools than in 2000. uh, 2010. We will, of course, be looking carefully across all elements of public public expenditure when we come to the spending review. But as I said to my honourable friend, I am sure the Chancellor has heard the uh, the, uh, uh, lobbying that my honourable friend has uh, indulged in in his question in relation to this matter, particularly for small rural schools. Stephen Morgan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Unlike this government, John Lewis has never knowingly undersold Portsmouth. But last week, partners announced they are closing Light and Lee, a much-loved store in the heart of my community since 1865. And that's just one example. Retailer after retailer, store after store, job after job. When will the government finally bring our high streets back from the brink? Minister. Obviously, I, I recognise this is a concerning time for the employees at Knight and Lee in uh, South Sea. Um, obviously, it's a commercial decision for the company to take. We will be ensuring that uh, the Department for Work and Pensions and Job Centre Plus will work with the company to understand the level of employee support required. But I have to say to the honourable gentleman that if he is worried about jobs in his constituency, the policies that would cause most damage to jobs in his constituency are the policies of the Labour Party and his Labour front bench. Douglas Ross. Last week, SNP-led Murray Council announced a number of devastating cuts to local services, many of which will impact young people, from closing libraries and swimming pools to ending the active schools programme and uh, increasing the fees on music tuition. These young people are affected, while the highest paid senior managers in the council are not. So will my right honourable friend agree with me that the SNP and Murray should focus on services rather than managers and call on the Scottish Government to deliver a fairer funding deal for Murray. Well, 
can I say to my honourable friend, of course, the UK government has increased the block grant that is going to the Scottish government yeah. next year. So decisions, decisions on cutting budgets are a matter of priority for the SNP rather than necessity. Extra money has been given to them. It's a question of where they want to put that money and what they put as a priority. And I think it's, it's a, a time that the SNP empowered local government in Scotland rather than hoarding power at Holyrood. Mr Stephen Hepburn. Next week is World Cancer Day. Last week, I regret that St Clair's Hospice in Jarrow closed through funding difficulties. Would the Prime Minister use her offices to facilitate a meeting between me and the relevant Health Minister to see if we can secure and ensure uh, health care for the terminally ill in the future in the Jarrow constituency? Prime Minister! I say to the Honourable Gentleman, I will ensure that the relevant Minister meets with him and addresses this issue with him. Rachel McLean. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. With record numbers of women in the workplace now, more and more women will experience the symptoms of perimenopause or menopause while they're at work. And, Mr Speaker, often these symptoms are not well understood by the general population and they include much more than just hot flushes and night sweats. So will the Prime Minister please join my campaign which calls on employers to update their health and wellbeing policies so that women can get full information and proper support so they can continue contributing at work. Prime Minister. I say to my, on, uh, thank, thank my honourable friend for raising this issue because obviously this is an issue that I think many members across this House will recognise and uh, recognise is an important issue. And we recognise the difficulties that women going through the menopause face. Um, we are encouraging employers to adopt menopause-friendly policies such as flexible working. We are giving women, uh, and giving women information about healthy lifestyles that may help to improve their experience of the menopause. And I would certainly, as my honourable friend is doing, encourage all employers to take reasonable steps, including those that she, my honourable friend has referenced, to support employees so that they can indeed can be able to continue to um, carry out their jobs and contribute to our economy in the way that they have done so far. Jack Dreamy. Prime Minister, we are 58 days away from a cliff. If we plunge over in a, the, into a precipice of abyss, our country will be a poorer country in every sense of the word. Last night, this House voted that there can be no question of a no-deal Brexit. Here, here, here. Will the Prime Minister honour the will of Parliament and rule out a no-deal Brexit? Because to proceed with a no-deal Brexit would not only impoverish our country, it would be contemptuous of Parliament. Here. Prime Minister. The is right that Parliament uh, last night voted to reject no deal. What Parliament also voted for last night was to say that it wanted to leave the European Union with a deal, and it, rec it identified what was necessary to change in the deal in order to enable that to happen and for the support of this House to be given to a deal. And that's where we should be focusing, because we can only ensure that we avoid no deal by having a deal, by agreeing a deal, and by this House supporting a deal and voting for a deal. Simon Clark. Yeah. May I commend my right honourable friend for her commitment yesterday to return to Brussels and reopen the text of the withdrawal agreement. That's the right thing to do, and people in Middlesbrough, South and East Cleveland will welcome it because yeah, they want yeah, yeah. to leave with a good deal for our country. Yeah, yeah. Can I commend the uh, compromise proposed by my honourable friend, the member for North West Hampshire, which I think is excellent and has every chance of success in uniting this, this Parliament and this country behind a good exit? Prime Minister! I say to my honourable friend that obviously there was a very clear message from the House last night as to what uh, needs to happen in terms of uh, returning to Brussels, but also we are engaging positively with the, uh, with the proposals that, he, as he said, our honourable friend, the member for North West Hampshire and others have put forward in, in relation to dealing with this issue of the backstop. Luke Pollard. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Next week marks five years since the train line at Dawlish was washed away in storms. Five years on, that train line remains fragile. We need money, not more press releases. Can the Prime Minister help unblock the £300 million upgrade that the DFT is sitting on and use the anniversary next week to help the South West, Plymouth and the rest of the uh, far South West keep our train line open and stop it being fragile and precarious? Yeah. Prime Minister. 
obviously passengers do expect better, and I understand that by the, from the Department of Transport, the first phase of work to protect the seawall at Dawlish began in November with essential repairs to the breakwaters, and that's part of the £15 million wider investment to make the railway at Dawlish and Tainmouth more resilient to extreme weather. And uh, can I just reassure uh, the uh, honourable gentleman that world-leading engineers have been carrying out those detailed ground investigations to develop that long-term solution for protecting the railway in a way that minimises disruption for passengers. And Network Rail will be uh, reporting soon on how they will deliver these. But I'm absolutely clear: delivering this improvement to the southwest transport infrastructure is a national priority. It is essential for unlocking the region's economic prosperity and jobs, and that's why we're giving it the focus we are. Maggie, through. Mr. Speaker. Cottenham Junior School in my constituency has increased its proportion of pupils attaining the required level of Key Stage 2 uh, standards from 35% to an amazing 67% over the last year. Will my right honourable friend join with me in congratulating the pupils, the teachers and the head, Simon Robinson, and 13 other primary schools across Erewash for all improving their Key Stage 2 performances? Prime Minister. Honourable friend, I'm delighted to hear of the increased performance at Cotman Hay Junior School. Um, we are seeing the education of children being improved, regardless of where they live or their background, uh, so that they can get the education they need to fulfil their potential. I'm happy to join my honourable friend in congratulating congratulating the pupils and the staff of that particular school, but also of the other schools she's referenced across her Erewash constituency, who have seen these improvements. These are important for the future of those children. Marsha de Cordova. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yesterday evening, MPs from across the House voted against a no deal, an outcome that the TUC warns would be devastating for jobs and which the CBI this morning says businesses will be speeding up preparations for. The people hit hardest by a no deal will be the ordinary people in Battersea and across the country. So will the Prime Minister finally listen to this House, to trade unions, to businesses and to our constituents and categorically rule out a no deal? Minister. To the Honourable Lady. The House rejected no deal last night, but I hope that she, when the time comes, will play her part in avoiding no deal and will vote for a deal. Mark Harper. Mr Speaker. Um, Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister knows that I want to make sure we leave the European Union on the 29th of March. She knows Regretfully, I couldn't support her deal two weeks ago because of the backstop, its impact on our relationship between Great Britain and Northern Ireland, uh, and trapping us potentially in a customs union. I am welcome the fact the House gave a clear majority yesterday to renegotiating the backstop. If she can deliver that, then I will vote for her deal, and I'm confident that we'll be a sustainable majority to get it through this House and the legislation. So, can I ask my Right, honourable friend, tell the European Union there is a majority in this House for that deal to get us out of the European Union on good terms, and I would ask my colleagues to give the Prime Minister space. They're not going to crumble tomorrow. We're going to have to hold our nerve, and we can be successful. Prime Minister! Can I say to my right honourable friend, he is absolutely right about the importance of the vote that took place last night. Because that vote, agreeing the, uh, what it was necessary to change in the withdrawal agreement in order to achieve a majority across this House, winning that vote with a majority gave a very clear message to the European Union that actually a deal can, be, uh, can go through this House, but it has to be a deal that recognises the concerns that the House has expressed across the whole of this House in relation to the backstop. Uh, that is what I'm going to be going and, uh, and fighting for, the change that this House has been very clear it wants to see in the future. And then, as my right honourable friend says, I'm confident we can see a sustainable and substantial majority across this House for leaving with the deal. Well, McDonough. Uh, Mr Speaker, um, Anna is a carer for the elderly. She lived with her girls in a flat above Barclays Bank. Because her husband left, 
She cannot pay the rent without claiming universal credit. She does not have a guarantor, so Barclays agents are evicting her. Another private landlord evicting a hard-working family on universal credit. Will the Prime Minister intervene and ask Barclays to grant her a tenancy so that her girls are not just two more in the 130,000 children in this country in temporary accommodation? Prime Minister. To the Honourable Lady, that obviously, again, like one of her honourable friends, she's raised an individual constituency case. And the details of that individual constituency case, I will ask the relevant minister to look into uh, that case and be to be to be. In, well, she asked me. She are, she's asking me to take a position purely on the question that she has asked me. I, want, I am asking the Minister in the relevant department to actually look into the case and to be able to assess that case and uh, to re- respond to the Honourable Lady. Nigel Huddleston. Thank you, Mr Speaker. This afternoon we shall be debating the Crime Bill, which, amongst other things, will facilitate the cross-border exchange of data, which will enable us to investigate crimes such as terrorism and paedophilia. Is it the responsibility of all of us in this House to wholeheartedly support that bill? Yes. 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 My honourable friend, absolutely, yes. This is a very important bill in the uh, impact that it will have. I am sure everybody across this whole House wants to ensure that we can deal with terrorism, with paedophilia and, indeed, with other uh, organised crime. Exchange of data is an important way of doing that, and I hope everybody will see the importance of the support for that. Uh, Mr Nigel Dobbs. Mr Speaker, um, in recent days we have heard the Irish Prime Minister talk about bringing his troops up to the border in the event of a no deal. We have heard the Irish Deputy Foreign Minister talking of people jumping out of windows. Is not this highly reckless talk, extremely dangerous in the present circumstances? That sort of rhetoric should be toned down. And instead, focus on what Michel Barnier said the other day, that even in the event of a no deal, we would sit down and find operational ways to have checks and controls away from the border. Isn't that the way forward? And it blows a hole in the entire concept of this backstop. Minister. Can I, can I say to the right honourable gentleman, obviously uh, it is important that we will be speaking to the Taoiseach later today, and it is important for us to work with the Government of Ireland on the arrangements that will be in place in the, in the future. We obviously have sent a clear message from this House about what needs to happen in relation to the backstop, um, but we retain our commitment to no hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland, and look to working with the Government of Ireland and with the European Union to ensure that we can all maintain our commitments under the Belfast and Good Friday Agreement and that commitment to uh, no hard border on the island of Ireland. Bob Blackman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, yeah. Last Sunday we commemorated Holocaust Memorial Day when we remembered the darkest period in Europe's history. Will my right hon friend join with me in thanking the Holocaust Educational Trust, yeah, yeah. its youth ambassadors and the incredible survivors who go give their personal testimony to young people so that they will remember what the ultimate destination of racial hatred and anti-Semitism truly is. Prime Minister. It is absolutely right to raise the excellent work that the Holocaust Holocaust Educational Trust does. Uh, And the youth ambassadors. I have met some of these youth ambassadors who have understood the importance of learning the lesson from the Holocaust, understood the importance of acting against uh, anti-Semitism wherever it occurs, and indeed of a wider racial hatred. And also, as as my honourable friend says, the survivors from the Holocaust who have given their time to ensuring that nobody is in any doubt about where man's inhumanity to man can lead. They have done a really important job and I pay tribute to them and to their continuing work. It is important that we all recognise the terrible uh, things that can happen when we let anti-Semitism occur. We should all be fighting against anti-Semitism wherever it occurs. Finally, Liam Byrne. Thank, Thank you, Mr Speaker. In the cold of Sunday, Kane Walker was found dead on the pavements of Birmingham. He was 31, and he became one of over 2,600 homeless people to have lost their lives in the last five years. When will the Prime Minister recognise 
the scale of homelessness today is a moral emergency, and we cannot wait until 2027 for this government to end homelessness for good when we need action now. Yeah. Yeah. Minister. First of all, say to the honourable gentleman, we all want to ensure that everybody in this country can have a safe and secure roof over their head, that nobody has to be on the streets sleeping rough. That is why we've made, we're putting money into this. We've made, taken a number of initiatives, initiatives like Housing First, which are already showing benefits in helping people who otherwise would be homeless and could end up on the streets in having a home and dealing with the issues that ensure they're able to stay in that home. This is, an issue. this is something that we recognise the importance of, and that's why we're putting money into it. That's why we're acting. That's why we are ensuring that action is being taken across the country to deal with this. Thank you. Order.